Hello and welcome to the Arms Control Poser Podcast. My name is William Albert, Director of Strategy, Technology and Arms Control at the International Institute for Strategic Studies in Berlin. I will be your host as we explore the world of arms control. On each podcast, I will interview the great and the good of the arms control community about a current event related to a treaty or agreement, past, present, or only proposed. Then together, we will go, hopefully, deep enough on the history and functioning of the agreement to help you make sense of it all. And, well, that's the idea anyway. This podcast is funded by the European Union Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Consortium. Now let's get underway. All right, welcome to the podcast today. I am very excited to have uh, Manuel Mekla here with me. We're going to talk about missiles and missile proliferation. First, why don't you introduce yourself, Emmanuel? Thanks. Uh, so I am Emmanuel Maître. I am a research fellow at the Foundation for Strategic Research, uh, Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique, based uh, near Paris. Uh, and I'm working here on, I would say, the whole spectrum of issues from non-proliferation, uh, disarmament, with of nuclear deterrence, and missiles as well. Great. All right. Thank you. And so the issue we want to talk about is... Uh, missile proliferation, the missile threat. So why don't you tell me, wh what do you think about um, missile proliferation, missile threat? What, how would you define the threat from uh, missile proliferation? Well, today? I think it's a, a little bit uh, a paradoxical situation. Definitely a situation that is uh, is evolving and is very uh, new, I would say, from the post-Cold War period where we really started thinking about missile proliferation and where it was very much focused on missiles that could carry WMDs, and that's actually why people started to care about the issue, because they realized that missiles were the preferred delivery vehicle for WMDs, and that as long as countries did not have them, the fact that they had a WMD program was a program was a problem, but it was not so much a problem as uh, when they were able to actually carry the threat to over uh, hundreds of kilometers. Today, I would say that this threat of uh, the dissemination of missiles to be used to carry WMDs from proliferating states. It's still, of course, a situation we, we see it in North Korea very, um, very often, but it's not as much, uh, I would say, concerning in many regions of the world as it was back in the 90s. However, we see a situation where missiles are being disseminated and used extensively as conventional weapons. So it's kind of a change of paradigm about how to, to think about uh, missiles. And we've seen, of course, in, in recent and ongoing conflicts in Yemen, uh, now in uh, Ukraine, the, the use of missiles on the battlefield, including actually missiles that technically could carry WMDs, but here are uh, clearly used uh, for conventional purpose, is really changing the way we can look at, at the issue and is also, of course, uh, feeding, I would say, probably the, de the demand for these kind of systems as conventional weapons. And so it creates uh, new problems, uh, new risks and new threats. But that are a bit different, probably, and we're going to, to talk about it, uh, than the threats that were considered when the regime's dressing missiles have been uh, designed. Well, I think that's a really imp important point because the threat from ballistic missiles in the past was considered linked to nuclear weapons because of missile inaccuracy. And mm -hmm. so the revolution in missile accuracy has meant that a much smaller explosive payload can do enormous damage to a point target, whereas previously these things, uh, what, what do you call missile um, circular error probability, the chance that they were going to hit a target 50% of the time uh, within a certain distance, ballistic missiles like the SS-3 or the SS-4, the primary Soviet medium-range missiles, had a CEP in, measured in miles. So you can imagine if a missile was supposed to hit you, but it hit four kilometers away, um, if it had an explosive payload, you probably might not even know about it. But if it had a nuclear payload, well, you would know now that those are much more accurate. What about cruise missiles? Do you see uh, cruise missiles as changing the nature of threat on the battlefield as well? Yeah, I think it... it follows a little bit the same trends, although maybe the perception is a bit different because uh, cruise missiles have been considered for a longer term, I would say, as weapons of use on the ground for conventional purpose. So the fact that it is uh, it is used uh, as such today is, is maybe less of an evolution of perspective. However, we see that it is, uh, they, they are also disseminated in many regions, many states uh, having an interest, and they are definitely including, I would say, for systems that could theoretically carry WMDs. So we are here again in a situation where we are not quite sure whether we should control weapons that 
in theory, could carry WMDs for a state that is trying to to um, acquire them for strictly conventional purpose. So I think the same, although the, the perspe- perception we have of those systems are a bit different, the end result or the end uh, problematic uh, is is about the same. When you think about the cruise missile threat, like, like how many countries are we talking about today that have uh, either substantial cruise missile stocks or the ability to make their own cruise missiles? Is this just a handful of states or is this a lot of states? Is, this, is the number of states growing or, or, or what would, how would you characterize that? I think it's at this stage, it's it's a, a I don't know if we can say a, a handful of states, but it's definitely growing. I think if we look at the picture of states that have capacities or are really uh, very close to getting them, we are talking about about 40 states which is slightly more than ballistic missiles, but in the same range we, for ballistic, we usually have a figure about uh, 30. But I think it's it's definitely uh, going to to grow, both in terms of states buying on-the-shelf cruise missiles and, and ballistic missiles, and uh, states that are, trying, that are developing uh, their own chain of production. And so what tools do we have in place to manage the threat from these missiles, to manage their proliferation? Uh, are there armed control treaties that address missiles or um, are there international agreements that limit their spread? So in terms of arms control and non-proliferation, there has been different kind of tools. But of course, the first thing that is uh, quite obvious is that there is no equivalent to, of course, uh, the BANS uh, treaty on, on missiles, like, for instance, chemical convention. There is no non-proliferation treaty like the NPT for, for missiles, and they won't be any in the foreseeable future, because there's always been the idea that uh, if those weapons are deemed useful for military strategy by some countries, then they should other countries should not be uh, prohibited from getting them. So we are in a situation where there is no norm that has been adopted. In Historically, the, the missiles have been mostly controlled, I would say, in a kind of secondary manner, especially in the framework of arms control agreement be- between the US and the uh, Soviet Union, because it was easier to control missiles than to control actually the nuclear weapons. So counting missiles, capping the number of missiles deployed, and actually prohibiting uh, some kind of missiles with the INF treaty was the way that was selected to actually limit uh, the uh, nuclear arsenals. And so the INF treaty, that's the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty between the US and the Soviets that started in 87 and was terminated by both sides. A few years yes, ago. Yes, exactly. And so the, the interest of the INF treaty is that it was a treaty that was prohibiting a whole range of types of uh, missile, cruise missiles and uh, ballistic missiles from deployment for the parties, of course, that had ratified and as long as they complied with their uh, obligation. So so that's a way that it's been dealt with for, for many years, but it was, I would say, a bit secondary in terms of the idea was really to regulate nuclear weapons as the end. Mm-hmm. Because those missiles were uh, designed to carry nuclear weapons. At the end of the Cold War uh, from the the 1980s, as uh, I was um, alluding to, there was a fear really that more and more countries were developing missile programs as a way to carry WMDs. And we saw that in many regions of the world, uh, in South Asia, in East Asia. East Asia, in the Middle East, many countries developing hand-in-hand uh, WMD programs, nuclear, but not only chemical, uh, biological, and also acquiring uh, missile programs, either through exports from old uh, Soviet systems or uh, trying to have their own uh, national domestic program. And it was clearly linked to the ability to carry carry WMDs. And so from that moment, there were an effort to try to, to limit uh, the, the spread of the systems. And what has been done uh, in, in 87 was the creation of an export control where uh, some countries decided to, uh, between themselves, to, to limit the, the technologies that, that they were selling abroad. Emmanuel, so who, who were those countries that led that effort? What, what countries were most interested in limiting? Because I, I would note that around this time, we're talking about the real spread of Soviet missile technology, the SCUD, other short not really medium and, and long range, but shorter range missiles with nuclear capabilities. Mm-hmm. So who really stepped forward to uh, limit that type of missile spread? So it, it really started in the US and when with uh, European partners or uh, like-minded countries. Uh, what is interesting is to see that after the end of the Cold War, the regime managed to get Russia on board and some former Eastern European countries that had been very active 
in the in the spread of those technologies as well. So by the 1990s, we had a, a regime that was far from being universal, but at least having some key players around that agreed that they should uh, respect some ground rules in terms of exporting some technologies that could be used to manufacture delivery vehicles able to carry WMDs. Uh, so that has been, I would say, the, the export control part that is still uh, relevant today. And lastly, there are two other ways in which uh, missiles have been regulated. Uh, one is through UN resolutions, through sanctions and prohibition for specific actors and countries. Uh, so we know, for instance, that because of their a violation of WMD agreement, North Korea and Iran have uh, had restrictions on what they are able to develop in terms of uh, missile technologies through UN UNSC uh, Security Council resolutions and also for um, non-state actors through the 1540 resolution, which also prohibits any any uh, state from transferring any WMDs and their means of delivery. That's quite interesting because it's one of the only texts in which we have really the association uh, close together between WMDs and their means of delivery. So that's uh, specifically prohibited to transfer those technologies to non-state actors. So that's, I would say, through the uh, UN. And the last uh, and, and kind of uh, one of a kind uh, approach has been through confidence building and transparency measures. And here we've had a interesting instrument, which is the A code of conduct against the ballistic missile proliferation. It was kind of derived from the MTCR partners who thought that they could try to have a text that would be universal in its nature and try to give some legitimacy to the norm of restraining the spread of those weapons. So this code of conduct was adopted in 2002 and it is linking two approaches. The first one is to once again, repeat the principle that states are trying to be uh, responsible in terms of what they share, technologies and materials, to avoid the spread of uh, missiles able to uh, carry WMDs. So that's kind of new. That was the first time that this norm was shared in a way that, that was trying to be universal uh, at some uh, level. And uh, the second kind of original uh, aspect is the uh, introduction of some transparency measure where states that are part of the, to the code uh, are invited to um, share information about their missile arsenals, but also to implement some risk reduction measures that are inspired by measures that existed before between the US and the uh, Soviet Union and then Russia on the notification of launches of ballistic missiles. If I could go back then to UN Security Council resolution, um, first of all, you mentioned 1540, which um, is a very useful tool to limit missiles capable of delivering WMD to non-state actors. But again, as you mentioned before, there has sort of been a delinking between missile technology and WMD delivery as the sole purpose. So would you think that there might be the need to change 1540 to address wider missile threats? Or do you think it's only going to be in the context of WMD delivery? I think that politically it's going to be difficult to uh, go away from the WMD purpose because some countries are going to question why uh, some countries are allowed to have uh, missiles in their arsenal for uh, security purposes, uh, including for conventional strikes, and some countries should not be allowed to have them. So here we are probably going to have a problem that is going to be, uh, I would say, political in nature. Now, the I would say the, the the clear limitation, I mean, the fact that we've seen, for instance, the Houthis relying so much on uh, missile strikes in the in the, the civil war in, in Yemen and even uh, to actually attack uh, neighbors in the Gulf has really pointed to the fact that we cannot uh, restrict the international efforts to WMD-able systems because a country is always free to say that it's not WMD-able and that it can, therefore, it, it's not covered in, in 1540. But I think the, the interest of 1540 in that matter is that it goes actually, I mean, the, the, the legal scope is uh, WMD means of delivery. But it kind of raised awareness in many countries of the world and it I would say export controls more globally on the dual use uh, technologies, dual use components, and it's helping also to increase the awareness and the 
I would say, the leads to capacity building in many regions of the world that are also a, a, a useful to to address the spread of many weapons, actually, that are not, uh, strictly speaking, covered in, in 1540. And so in, in missiles, uh, I think it's, it's uh, useful as well. So, of course, interesting thought there. So the combination of the existence of the missile technology control regime and the 1540 can create a better norm to raise awareness of the need to limit missile spread, even though conventionally armed missiles aren't necessarily covered by that. And we also see with there are other UN Security Council resolutions, uh, for instance, tied to uh, North Korea or Iran that are more generally focused on missiles and not necessarily tying directly to WMD, but to the to their testing and uh, spread of missiles. So there could be at least some understanding by countries that even if they're not a member of the MTCR, even if the missiles that we're talking about aren't explicitly tied to WMD, that there's still a need to limit their spread. Yes. And I think uh, one thing that is also appearing quite clearly is that we used to have a, a kind of agreed definition of what was a missile able to carry WMDs. It was the technical criteria that appear in the MTCR about the range and the payload capacity. But what we've seen in um, the Houthi situations is that some of the missiles that are being used by the non-state actors in that matter uh, technically are go beyond those the thresholds in terms of range, uh, that's 300 kilometers, and, and uh, payload 500 uh, kilograms. So, so for countries that are trying to implement their international commitments, and uh, 1540, of course, is UNSC uh, resolution, so it's mandatory for everybody to uh, implement it, it really leads to more awareness across the board, whatever the purpose of the weapon, if they realize that some kind of metal exports may be used in uh, missile programs, or for instance, uh, there are examples of countries that are considering whether or not uh, the, the vehicles that they are producing, road vehicles, uh, may be used to actually carry missiles as mobile launchers, for instance. No matter, I would say, the end purpose of the weapon, whether it's conventional or, or nuclear, it's the same technology at the at the basics. And, and so I think it has uh, led to a better understanding of what kind of technologies were involved and to a better awareness in, in yeah in many cases for states that are producing du dual use technologies and that are uh, better aware of the uh, risk of proliferation well and, and interesting that you mentioned that because the other type of system that can cause some concerns we just saw over the past two days the launch of a North Korean space vehicle, a space launch vehicle, uh, attempting to loft a spy satellite and it failed. And when that was launched, the Japanese actually went into alert as though it were a ballistic missile because, of course, space launch vehicle and ballistic missiles are closely related as mm -hmm. former German scientist Werner von Braun, who went, went from the, the Nazi weapons program to the NASA to help the United States build space launch vehicles. So how do we address the crossover between space launch vehicles and the potential for ballistic missiles in international controls? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And of course, it's not, I would say, a, a question that is limited to missiles. Uh, the, other, the other WMDs, or I would say the, the real WMDs maybe, are also concerns with the dual use technologies and uh, with the necessity to make sure that the restrictions that are adopted to limit the spread of weapons do not impact uh, civilian technologies and development. So I think what has uh, been done in the field of missile is quite comparable to the other systems, except there is not a big regime like the NPT that can really, or, or the IAEA for nuclear, that can really try to promote civilian use while uh, restricting nuclear and to, to verify the, the difference. So in the MTCR, we have, of course, uh, restrictions that are on, as you said, the, say, the launchers that can, could be used for uh, missiles or for uh, satellite uh, launching vehicles. Uh, what is quite interesting is to look at how the Hague Code of Conduct is uh, tackling the issue because it has uh, really the same transparency obligations uh, for states uh, on both types of vehicles. So, for instance, a country that is part of the Hague Code of Conduct has to pre-notify why uh, the country is doing a missile test, uh, for instance, ICBM test or SLBM, so ballistic missiles launched from uh, submarines. But they are and also... And this is called the pre-launch notification, is that right? Exactly, exactly. So 
they will send a, a notification to all the other uh, states that are part of the Hague Code of Conduct to tell them that from certain geographical area, they are about to launch a system and that it's going to arrive in such or such uh, area. These types of notifications also exist for space uh, launchers. So the idea here is really to limit the possibility that a state might confuse a space a space launch uh, with a, a, a missile attack. And, and of course, we have in mind the incidents that, that took place right after the Cold War, I think in, in 1995, where the Russians misinterpreted Norwegian sounding rocket launch and, and um, that the early warning system of the uh, Russian Federation was uh, activated as though it was a missile launch. So, of course, then the political site in, in Russia realized that it was a mistake and that there was no missile launch. But the fact that the detection of the launch was similar for, for a sounding rocket in the north of Norway and for a submarine launched missile that would have been cruising in, in the northern seas as well, uh, shows that there is a, really a proximity and it was important for the drafters of the Hague Code of Conduct to take that into account and to require the same level of transparency for both types of systems. Well, and of course, then there's also the Outer Space Treaty, one of the earliest um, treaties on weapons of mass destruction, 1967, which limits the placement of nuclear weapons in space and in fact actually forced the US and the Soviets and now the, the Russians and the Chinese into a fractional orbital bombardment yes. systems, I think, FOBs, I think they call them, because they don't want to let a nuclear weapon orbit the Earth because that would be a violation of the treaty. No. And here we, we see that the I would say the arms control in space efforts uh, uh, and, and conversation is also very difficult. If we look again at what we have, interesting to see that the HCOC has a, a provision to invite states to actually sign uh, the Outer Space uh, Treaty. So it's still uh, deemed as one of the fundamental convention in, in the field, but with nothing to really prevent the use of space for military purpose. And we see that here again, we are, uh, I think, just as with missiles in a situation where the number of countries interested in using space for military purpose is going to, to rise rather than decrease and any prospect for arms control, whether it is between states that have the, the capacities or if it's to try to prohibit newcomers uh, to uh, use uh, sta uh, space for military purpose. This is going to be extremely difficult in the in the coming future. It's uh, kind of an interesting way at getting at space, but it still doesn't get to the full issue of um, space and the missile crossover. That's a good place to take a break. We're going to come back in just a second with Emmanuel Maitre. You're listening to William Alberg on the Arms Control Poser podcast. So on, on the Hague Code of Conduct, I don't think we established, where exactly did the Hague Code of Conduct come from? Who negotiated it under, you said 2002, but under what conditions did they come together to negotiate that? And who, who so were the parties around the table? First, I would throw through uh, the uh, MTCR and the G7 as well, where it was kind of developed. And the idea of a Code of Conduct came into fruition, uh, as I said, with the dual uh, objective, one to kind of universalize the norm of non-proliferation, and second, to multilateralize the confidence-building measures that existed between the US and Russia at the time. Uh, so then, back in 2002, the states opened a, a convention to, to negotiate, actually, the, the text of the treaty open to all states. There were more than uh, 90 states that took part in the three big uh, meetings where the text was modified from the initial drafts. And I think it was 93 uh, states that actually uh, sat in The Hague in uh, November 2002 and, and signed the, the treaty. And uh, we've seen that, uh, not the treaty, sorry, the, the Code of Conduct. And we, we've seen that the, the text has uh, had the ability to gather more support in the 20 years it's been around since we have now 144 the subscribing states. Wow, that is quite impressive. But still, as you point out, it's it, right now it just has the confidence-building measures 
on the exchange of information and the pre-launch notifications. What, what do you think is holding the Hague Code of Conduct back from becoming a more substantial agreement, from having more teeth to it? Because I think when it was negotiated, the hope was that it would be you know, that the, that the initial agreement would only be a minimum, a floor, not a ceiling. Mm -hmm. What do you think holds back on that? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think there was at the time, for instance, some countries that were showing uh, skepticism on the fact that it was, a, for instance, a non-legally uh, binding agreement, that were hoping that we would be able to uh, negotiate something that would be legally binding. But, but I would say there are two reasons why we uh, have not been able to develop the code beyond its initial provisions. The first one is that in the first years, there was a focus really on, on trying to get it universal and to make sure that already what is in the code, so principle of non-proliferation, transparency, information, and trying to avoid the misinterpretation of a launch, that more countries would commit to it. We are still missing some, I would say, some key countries such as China, Iran, and North Korea, of course. So the, the hope was to already try to, to get those uh, on board on the text as it is and to, to try to avoid making a, a more complex agreement while this one was already not uh, fully implemented and, and fully universal. Uh, now in the recent years, we've seen that it's a, a regime that is linked to consensus during the, the meeting of, of state parties and clearly to be very frank and, and to, to in the in the current context, it seems that it's already very good that it's holding on, that the countries are implementing it. Uh, Russia and, and, and the US, we, we've seen that the discussion being extremely tense in, the, in this forum, as in any, I would say, multilateral forum, but with the use of uh, missiles by Russia on Ukraine, it's created really uh, strong tensions. And so the idea of uh, reforming the, the code or to expanding its scopes or, or things like this. It's extremely difficult in the current political context, but there is clearly a satisfaction that it's still functioning. Uh, states are still sending notifications and actually new states are uh, subscribing uh, with, for instance, uh, this summer, uh, Sao Tome and, and Principe has been adding its name to, to the list of uh, subscribing states. So that's already not too bad, I would say, given the, the very difficult political situation. Can you talk at all about the the compliance rates with uh, Hague Code of Conduct? Do you find that we're getting full and complete pre-launch notifications from all the major players, from um, the United States, from Russia, from uh, other countries? Or, or are you finding that implementation is a little bit spotty? Uh, and has it been consistently good or, or uh, consistently bad? Can you talk anything about that? Yes, so on the implementation of the Hague Code of Conduct, of course, uh, we do not have the uh, official figures that are shared only between uh, subscribing states, except if some of the state is uh, releasing them uh, publicly. What is interesting is to see that at the very beginning, uh, there was some problems of implementation between uh, Russia and the US because they were doing it bilaterally. And so they were not necessarily uh, sending the info with the on the system. But this has been solved pretty soon in the early 2000s. And so now on, on those countries, there, there is no, no problem. Concerning the pre-notification, so that concerns only, of course, some states in the, in the regime, the states that are launching things, whether it is uh, space launch vehicles or ballistic missiles. All those states are complying with the, their definition of what has to be pre-notified which is not the same for all countries. For instance, some countries decide that sounding rockets need to be pre-notified. Other are going to consider that only space launch vehicles that actually put something in orbit have, uh, have to be uh, pre-notified. So it, it leads to a kind of discrepancy in practices, but this is not strictly a problem of compliance because there is no very strict definition of what you have to pre-notify. Now, of course, if we look at missiles, there is, I would say, an understanding that short-range systems do not have to be pre-notified. For instance, Russia has not considered even before the war that it has to pre-notify when it's uh, launching uh, an Iskander short-range missile for practice purposes. Of course, it's not notifying anybody when it does it for as, as a, a strike during the, the, the war. But this is, I would say, a common practice. It's, it's shared by, by all states. 
Because the Iskander, I mean, the Russians say that the Iskander has a range of 500 kilometers, and it's clearly designed, I mean, the Russians say that it's designed to carry a nuclear warhead. Mm -hmm. So why does that not count for, I, I thought the short range ended at 300 kilometers, or do they use a different definition for missile range? There is no definition. So it's, I would say, whatever the state feel like doing, and then uh, states could protest and, and ask for explanation during the, the meetings of state parties. I think they have been inspired, especially the US and Russia, from what they have done in the past, and which is mostly focused on intercontinental uh, missiles or con missiles that they could spot through their early warning systems and stuff like this, where there could be a risk of misinterpretation as long as the missile that is under test is done within the boundaries of Russia. I think, it, I would not say it should not be pre-notified. Personally, I think it would be great if, if it was pre-notified. But I guess the U.S. does not have the same concern over it as for um, ICBM tests. So okay. I think the focus has been to right. do on I ICBM and SLBM mostly because that's what was done in the past and where the greatest risk was. I see. So, so in that sense, that's really helpful. So in that sense, the hate code of conduct in terms of definitions isn't strictly tied to the missile technology control regime. In this case, it's an example where the hate code of conduct is actually tied back to the U.S.-Soviet ballistic missile notification agreement from 1987, which was, as you point out, tied more to ICBMs and not tied towards theater or battlefield systems. I think that's not official. I, I would say it seems to be the interpretation that the states are having, because technically speaking, I think it would be right to say that it's tied to the MTCR definition because it says ballistic missiles that are able to carry WMDs. So then it's a matter of interpretation. Of course, the A code is it's a code of conduct. It's uh, voluntary in its implementation sure. and there is no verification systems or, or whatever. So the states are, are allowed to protest and to ask for explanations, but then it's a matter of political decision whether or not you point out to the attention of the other uh, members that you believe there is a, a, a lack of, of implementation. And it depends on different states. I think, but I think that is important. So the Hague Code of Conduct, I mean, for context, was negotiated in 2002. That was during the George W. Bush administration. George W. Bush was not known for a love of arms control. And, you know, one of the questions always is, how did this advance occur during that administration? And I would imagine it would be much easier to sell to them if this was already something that the U.S. and Russia did bilaterally. So putting it into this other agreement would, would make sense. Not saying, again, as you point out, that that wasn't the explicit agreement from other countries, but that the selling point to someone like John Bolton, who was then a big part of the U.S. government's approach of trying to get away from arms control obligations rather than adding them on. So that, that, that seems to make sense to me. I wanted to go back a little bit to the missile technology control regime because you noted very well it's, it's remarkable that the Hague Code of Conduct is continuing to function, that the state's parties are still meeting, although there is still a substantial list of countries that are not party to the agreement, uh, including countries like Egypt and Brazil and China and Israel and, of course, North Korea. But so still, there's some good work to be done in order to expand it. But I would also note that missile technology control regime has survived some very difficult times as well. And I, I wanted, is there anything you can tell me about the technical bodies of the treaty and the kinds of work that they do? Because I think there is this, I think there's a misunderstanding that the missile technology control regime, sort of like the Hague Code of Conduct, is some vague agreements and some meetings of states' parties. But I think missile technology control regime has some really kind of extraordinary technical aspects to it in terms of um, um, additional information, uh, when we talk about intangible information, when we talk about export control, that goes a lot deeper than that. So can you talk a little bit about what mechanisms does the missile technology control regime have in terms of controlling technologies and what sort of bodies meet regularly to try to work that ahead? Yeah, I think it's interesting to, to compare a bit the two regimes, uh, MTCR and, and HCOG, they are very different, but to some extent confronted to, to uh, common challenges. And I would say challenges that are now very uh, usual for any arms control and non-proliferation framework. And uh, the main one is that at the political level, of course, it's extremely tense, extremely difficult. We know that there won't be any agreement on any, I would say, major evolution of those regimes for MTCR. Uh, there's no expectation that uh, Russia and, and, and Western countries could, could agree on, on anything major. But as you uh, mentioned, at the technical level, 
it's still working. It's still uh, looking at the technologies that have to be controlled. What I think is, is fascinating about the MTCR is that there is this control list, uh, the annex is very detailed and uh, very up to date. And even if it's difficult nowadays to uh, modify them or to, to really ha have a, a consensual approach on, on how to go forward with them, they are actually quite up to date with new technologies as well. They are, have been designed in such a way that they cover a lot of things. And they are not only used by MTCR states, but by many states that are uh, adopting uh, those control lists uh, as a standard uh, in, in the world. Uh, so they have an impact in, in that way. I think that is quite remarkable. We said at the beginning, more and more countries are able to produce uh, missiles, whether it is cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, uh, or, or others. It, it's true. And of course, it limits the, the role that export control regime can have. But on the other hand, I think we see even today, we'll see probably with, with Russia, at some point, those limitations are, have some effect. They might limit the ability of a state to acquire the most high-tech components uh, for its guidance system or whatever. It, it has a role, I think, in, in limiting the spread of some technologies, uh, some qualitative improvement of, of um, arsenals. So there is this discrepancy here again, I think, bec between what can be done at the political level and the fact that the regime is still working a bit in the shadow, a bit out of the out of the spotlight, but the technical norms that it it has set and the the technical uh, meetings that it's doing on implementation are, are still playing the the some some role. Well, yeah, and that's always the that's always the trick. On the one hand, having the agreement out of the spotlight, having the work that happens on a day-to-day -day basis out of the spotlight might actually help remove some of that political pressure that would otherwise be there and might um, you know, actually harm the functions of the treaty. But I, I do think that the regular meetings in the, what are they called, the, the technical experts meeting and mm -hmm. the... Yes. What's the other one? The export control expert meeting? Uh, yes, Tem and Lem. The and the licensing and enforcement experts meeting. This, and there's this has to be the this. MTCR equipment, software, and technology annex. I mean, that's that's also kind of an extraordinary achievement. Exactly. And you know, by keeping this sort of to the expert level, maybe that keeps that away from some of the political pressures. But do you see political pressures entering into MTCR? Do you see difficulties ahead? Well, as you said, the fact that the the experts of the different countries are able to meet and to talk on technologies on the way they are implemented within the two uh, main working groups, the technical expert meeting and the uh, LEM uh, on licensing. Is a, is a great achievement, but of course, it, the fact that no political decision can be made means that there are things that are that, that they cannot do. They cannot propose any modification, important modification of the annexes today would would not have any chance to be adopted. And I think it, it, exactly the same a problem that would be faced with other uh, regimes and agreements. Once again, each uh, code of conduct you can propose to expand the scope of the of the the code right now it it's not going to be adopted at the a political level so whatever the good technical decisions you want to come up with it has to be really below the the range of things that would require a, a political agreement I'm, I'm aware that there's obviously the biggest political limitation within the missile technology control regime is the block on new members and I understand it's that Russia, a lot of the countries that are emerging with missile technology are, are either Western aligned or NATO members. And Russia doesn't want a larger group of those kinds of states, you know, as members of the agreement. So instead, they've come up with this idea of adherence. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, you, you explain the situation uh, very accurately. There is a difficulty to uh, admit new members due to political positions by, by some. And so there is this idea that countries can be can adhere to the guidelines and uh, observe the, the meetings, but not be uh, formal uh, partners, which has uh, worked for a couple of them. I think there are uh, four or, or five countries that have this special status, but uh, other countries are quite opposed to to joining the, the uh, regime as uh, in that um, capacity because they see themselves a little bit as having all the inconvenience of joining but not the benefits of actually having a, a voice in the um, 
in the regime and, and be able to participate to the elaboration of guidelines and, and so on. So there is this idea that it represents a little bit of a second tier citizens uh, and that it's not very attractive for countries to, to tell them to just actually implement rules that are being made by uh, others. So I think that that's one of the blocking difficulties for, for, for the MTCR. But that's going to be one of the biggest difficulties no matter what you do, because the, the fact is, so MTCR functions essentially as a cartel, those countries with missile technology trying to limit it from going to countries that don't. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of countries that are now gaining that technology that are not part. Okay, that's one problem due to the internal issues. But the other problem is we either agree that the spread of missiles is a global problem and we have global rules or we have this cartel system where some states are do you know what i mean it's very it's very mm -hmm. difficult I, I mean i've always thought that one of the biggest challenges here is that we need a universal global agreement on missile and missile proliferation but in order to do that you would have to either do the npt thing of enshrining have and have nots or you would have to promise the abolition of missiles, which I don't think is going to happen. Do you see any prospects moving forward for a way to get the kind of inclusivity that we see in a Hague Code of Conduct, plus the tough rules that we have in MTCR, and ultimately getting countries that are outside both of these agreements, like Egypt and China and North Korea and Israel, inside? Is, is there any prospect for this? Is there any path forward towards more universal, universalization, not necessarily of these agreements, but universal, universalization on the rules, on the spread of missiles, on the use of missiles, on limitations regarding missiles? Well, unfortunately, I'm not very uh, optimistic on, on that prospect. As you uh, said, there are two things that are not possible. The f I mean, in the current geopolitical context, we can always uh, hope that it might change in the future. But the first one is a global prohibition of missiles, that would be unacceptable for a number of countries. Uh, I mean, a great number of countries, including those that are very influent in ma making rules. The second one is kind of NPT mechanism with have and have nots. I mean, it's absolutely clear that this would be unacceptable for, for a vast majority of countries. I really sense that anything, any global regulations that would prohibit or limit the kind of systems that can be developed would be more and more difficult to, actually more and more and not less and less difficult to uh, sell today. And that is because more countries are actually being in, interested in seeing what missiles could do for their national security as conventional weapons. And you mentioned it at the beginning, the technical evolutions that we've seen, the fact that it can be used as for precision strike on short range or even medium range is very interesting for many countries that are not, I mean, clearly not interested interested in WMDs, have some security issues in, in their neighborhood and are really not willing to restrict themselves, at least from considering the acquisition or the development of those systems. And the conversation we can have with those countries on even very light norms, like the Hague Code of Conduct, for instance, which is, once again, transparency, some general principles, uh, there is a fear that it might limit the possibilities later down the road to, to develop some systems. So I think this combined to the fact that uh, major powers and missile powers are now very unrestricted in the way they can develop uh, missiles. We see, for instance, with the end of the INF Treaty, we mentioned at the beginning that it leads to the possibility to uh, develop other new, new uh, categories of missiles. This is obviously being looked at elsewhere. And I think it really limits the, the possibility to, to create a, a global regime for them. And it looks like it's a problem that's going to advance further and further because more and more countries are either desiring to have their own space launch programs that will have a missile crossover. Uh, and then just other countries that are looking at different conflicts around the world and saying that with higher precision and cheaper materials, uh, anyone can build missiles. And so why would we forego them? Which seems to hint, based on the note of pessimism you've got in there, that we're looking at a world where there may be a lot more missile proliferation uh, that we may be at, at you know, at at a time of acceleration of missile proliferation rather than increased missile control. Yeah, I think that's clearly something we we are probably going to see. What uh, remains important, however, is that most of those most of those programs and, and uh, strategies are strictly conventional. And if we remember where we started from, which was the idea that missiles are dangerous because they can carry WMDs, then it's not exactly the same problem we are tackling. Today, it's a conventional weapon proliferation problem. So 
keeping the focus also on the fact that it's important to control delivery vehicles because they can be used to uh, transform a WMT threat from theory to practice uh, is something that is important and where we might be a little bit more hopeful because here we've been able, of course, not not all the time, uh, DPRK is 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 a case in point, but uh, to to some extent to to be a bit more successful, I would say, in raising awareness on on the risk uh, of those connections between uh, missiles and WMDs, and to stop some programs through through different uh, measures, negotiations, diplomacy, force, in some cases. But here, uh, the the story has been a, a bit different. But clearly, on the conventional front, I'm, I think the the it's going to be more and more difficult to 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 control anything. Well, I think that's about where we can leave it for part one. Emmanuel, thank you very much. My thanks once again to Emmanuel Maitre for so expertly walking us through the threat from missile proliferation that we face today and the tools that we have to address these threats, the Missile Technology Control Regime, the Hague Code of Conduct. We even touched on the Outer Space Treaty in there as well. When we come back in just a second, we're going to talk to Emmanuel about her life, her time, and her career. So thanks for sticking with us. Back in just a second. Welcome back to part two of the Arms Control Poser podcast. I'm William Albrook. I'm here with Emmanuel Maitre, where I ask her about her life and her times. Emmanuel, let's start at the beginning. How did you get into arms control? Um, I think mostly by accident, like many <laughs> in the field, but uh, uh, yeah. both, I would say, accident and uh, circumstances that would be global, I would say. The, the, so the personal circumstance is that I... Um, I studied political science. Uh, I always had this uh, interest for uh, international affairs uh, strategy as such. What were you studying? You you you, you say international affairs. Were you, was this a topic at university, or was this yes. a, a before university as well? No, at, at university at Sciences Po in Paris, um, had the chance to. Uh, right, that's, the, that's the main. That's the, I mean, you know, some of our listeners are, aren't as aware. So that's the Harvard of uh, France, right? One of the biggest, most important places to go and get your education. For political science and economics, I would say. Yeah. Uh, we, it, it's, okay. it's, a, it's not a scientific school. So it's, it's yeah, political science. Uh, once again, international affairs. I had a chance to uh, intern uh, in the US at the French embassy uh, to um, intern at Brookings, discover a bit the world of think tanks, uh, and, uh, and and really uh, felt that it was an incre- incredible uh, place to, to work. And so I was looking for uh, opportunities in, in that um, sector, I would say, uh, yeah, strategic studies and um, international affairs. And I think um, back uh, when I started at FRS uh, 2013, we were really in um, both in a different context, but we already had the uh, premises of what was coming. And so there was a demand for expertise in non-proliferation initially, uh, right in the middle, for instance, of the Iran uh, GCPOA negotiation, or I mean, uh, very um, a few few months before that uh, period. Um, so I had a chance to, to, to start at FRS and, and uh, right away work on, on those issues, uh, non-proliferation, uh, follow disarmament as well. Um, and then uh, the circumstances uh, changed also, and there was increasing uh, demand for arms control expertise, but also from, I would say, more security, a, a bit less non-proliferation and a bit more... Uh, strategy, deterrence, uh, nuclear uh, relationship between major powers and, and things like this uh, after uh, 2017 and, and so on. Okay. So so you saw a transformation even from 2013 to 2017, uh, the pivot, I guess, coinciding with uh, Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea, but also the Wales summit and the Warsaw summit and the toughening of NATO's stance and France's strengthening of their deterrence conversation at NATO itself as well. That had an influence on FRS. I, I think uh, on FRS and on everybody in Europe where there was 
uh, well, first in, in France, I mean, but also in other countries, uh, especially nuclear weapon countries, we've had this feeling that there was a need to have a new generation of uh, researchers and experts on strategic affairs, on uh, nuclear issues, especially. And so there was an effort to um, train more people in, in the field. Uh, and uh, I think I was right in that um, uh, in, in that time frame and effort where there was the feeling that after the 90s, there was a, a bit of a loss of expertise in those fields, a lack of interest. People were working on other issues, Middle East, terrorism, um, other important issues, uh, but that there was a bit less people uh, working on those kind of Cold War-ish uh, arms control um, elements. And so uh, I was lucky enough to come at a time and to be able to start on that and, and realize that it was here, I would say really unfortunately a field where uh, I would probably have uh, worked for the rest of my life because there was, uh, once again, unfortunately, it was back in the day-to-day um, -day conversation and, and even more in the, in the past uh, few years um, to, to trying to understand how to manage the uh, nuclear relationship between uh, countries that are uh, very close to, to being in, in in a confrontation uh, together and, and so on and so forth. So that's been um, a little bit the, yeah, the evolution maybe of, of uh, my work at affairs. So have you, have you been working a lot on or studying deeply, more deeply, the US, Russia, uh, China, North Korea, Iran, uh, and France's nuclear deterrent and how it functions in the world and, and those deterrent relationships? Yes. Uh, so so um, that's the, the evolution I was kind of referring to from starting for, for, for me personally and for, for many people in the field, I think we've uh, had this uh, uh, at least need to, to look at the issues more broadly and from starting from non-proliferation per se to expand and look at the, um, the, whole, um, the whole spectrum of, of issues from a, a security perspective. So I've got a really clear picture then of how you went, you know, in your current job, starting off looking at non-proliferation more, but pivoting more towards deterrence. Um, but still a little sketchy on the background. So first, let's start at the beginning. Where were you born? What is your question? I'm sorry. Where were you oh, born? Where I was born. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so I was born in uh, Normandy, in, in uh, France, in the city of Rouen, which is uh, quite close to Paris. And did your parents have and, uh, international jobs? Were they looking at international security or, or no? No, they, they were teachers. Okay. Both teachers, okay. So both very interested in education. So they must have been happy that you went to Sciences Po. Yes, yes. <laughs> was that expected, or was it just a very nice thing? Were you the first from your family to go there, or or was it just expected everyone goes there? No, I was the first one, but it was uh, linked to my interest more than to a willingness to go to the school. It was I wanted to study international affairs, so that was a kind of logical place to try to go to. So even before university, you were really interested in international affairs. What yes. about international yes. affairs? What, what hooked you? Was it the Iraq war? Was it before that? Was it some other conflict that got you really paying attention? Was it a particular politician? Or what, what made you interested enough to want to go to this very illustrious school and get your education? <laughs> I, I don't remember. I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't no, that's okay. That's smart, so, perfectly... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a professor at university who in particular inspired you uh, in international affairs and made you look more towards the regulation of these issues or nuclear weapons or arms control or non-proliferation or was this just self-guided? Did, did, did you have an inspirational professor who, who guided your way or um, no? I had as a teacher Thérèse Delpech who uh, in uh, oh. France was, was quite uh, renowned and, and famous because of her um, influence on these issues and also her both, I would say, combination of a practical experience uh, being very much in the field as um, as she worked at the uh, Atomic Energy Commission, but also having this theoretical background and being a philosopher, I think, by uh, training, she had also an ability to uh, think about the issues in a historical perspective and to really have a lot of deep uh, background and knowledge on, on those issues. So uh, maybe that was a, a first uh, introduction. Um, then I, I had the privilege to intern um, 
twice in in Washington DC, which is not a bad place to to be when you want to, <laughs> right, right. Uh, to 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 learn more and to feel a little bit how things are being uh, negotiated. Uh, in, in, uh, but for just a second, I, I just wanted to mention so Teresa Del Pesh, uh, author of uh, Nuclear Deterrence in the Twenty First Century: Lessons from the Cold War for a New Era of Strategic Policy, a very important book. Uh, you can download a version of that uh, from the Rand website incredibly influential and she passed away sadly just a real giant there did she tell you to go to dc or did you just know that dc was a good place to go for these kinds of internships yes i guess i uh, wanted to go and had the chance to uh, get the internships and so you went to brookings is that right yes uh, so and the, who first did... one, the first one was uh, at the french embassy and the second one at brookings uh, yeah. where i worked uh, uh, as an intern uh, for the uh, center on for the uh, U.S. and Europe, something like this. Did you use your time when you were um, at the French embassy to sort of scope out the DC system and try to figure out where to Absolutely. go? Absolutely, uh, we spent. Uh, we had the the. It was really a great job uh, because we were sent to cover the think tank events and to uh, kind of report on what was going on. So it was amazing to have the chance to. Um, Yes, understand the influence of, of think tank of uh, 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 and, and how the, the stage is working and, and so on and so forth, and, and discover also the officials working in the field. So yeah, that was quite a privileged place to be. Well, no, I think that's something that's really important when people want to get into the field. You know, how do you get into the field? And here was an amazing circumstance where you had an internship where your job was basically to figure out, you know, which think tank you wanted to go to, which is pretty excellent. But also you being smart enough to use that opportunity to really explore that rather than just, you know, be an intern and go out in Adams Morgan all the time and, and uh, sleep in a lot. No, you know what I mean? You, you really used your time strategically and became a known figure. And then it was easier for them then to bring you in at Brookings. Hopefully. <laughs> uh, who did you work with at Brookings? Uh, Justin Weiss, uh, who was uh, a French uh, uh, researcher and professor uh, working there. Uh, and uh, maybe that was influential as well because he made me work a lot. He was re uh, writing at the time a biography of, um, I don't know if I'm going to say the name right, but speak me of Rychinski. Oh, Rychinski. God. <laughs> please, please say it. Oh, we both can get this wrong. Shabignu Rychinski? Let's, yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, but, but since he was uh, writing his biography, he asked me to read all his writing. Oh, wow. um, and so I wrote, uh, I read all the writing of uh, Mr. Brzezinski, uh <laughs> and I had the opportunity to dive and he wrote a lot. He wrote a lot about what was happening in the 70s, in the 80s. And so I had the chance to look at the Cold War from his perspective and a lot of it uh, dealt with the, the issues that we are uh, we've been uh, talking today, uh, so maybe that was a, a little bit uh, something also that uh, gave me the um, the interest, uh, Mr. Brzezinski. <laughs> so then, when you when you graduated, did you go right to FRS, or was there an interim step? Did you did you roll right into your to your uh, the job as you have it today, or did you go somewhere else first? Uh, I went to a, a private consulting firm first for, for a, a few years, but uh, that was not at all in the field. And that was more waiting for an opportunity to present. No, I think that's, also, again, that's important. So you, you found a job that would pay, that would let you buy time until the right slot opened up. Yes. Now, that's really important. Yeah. I mean, not everyone is just made of money and can, you know, just parachute in. No, it's hard. Yeah. I, that's exactly what I had to do. I had to take terrible jobs when I first graduated from college before the right job opened up. So I understand that. Okay, so is there any advice you would give yourself earlier in your career that you think would, would have made your career better or more satisfying or more useful or anything um, else? Well, something that I think we share a lot between us arms control people um, is a lack of technical background from, I would say, training. Uh, and I know that, for instance, at Sciences Po now, they have tried, after I left, actually, uh, they tried to put more science in the in the curriculum at the beginning because they realized that uh, political experts can be um, shamefully uh, bad at science. Uh, and in our field, it means a lot. And so we try to catch up, but it's always a bit difficult when you're uh, missing the basis. So I would say not to neglect uh, neglect the, the science part because it's fundamental to understand. And I think it's going to be increasingly 
uh, we are talking about, we've not uh, talked actually about uh, hypersonic, uh, about uh, uh, dual, dual use technologies, rocket science, whatever. We don't have to be engineers and to understand and to, to be able to build those systems, but it's good to understand a little bit how they work. Um, so maybe that's something that's uh, quite useful to uh, look at uh, early on in the in, while we are studying. I could not agree more. I think that's so important to understand the science. And, you know, we have uh, in English the, the phrase, well, I'm no rocket scientist. But I, if you're going to work on missiles, you should at least know a rocket scientist. And I know uh, my good friend and colleague, Marcus Schiller, actually did a book of science technology for professionals. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that yes. folks who, who don't have that scientific background can understand a little bit more of the science behind it. So great advice, I think. And I think that's it. I mean, thank you uh, for being here today. I really appreciate you taking the time and sharing your wisdom with us and here in part two on sharing uh, about who you are and how you got here and uh, best of luck going forward. Thank you very much. That's all we have time for today. Thank you once again to Emmanuel Mecle for spending time with me. Thanks to the European Union Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Consortium for funding this podcast. And as always, thanks to B.L.B. Freeman for the excellent music. You can find more of his music by following the link in the program notes. I've been your host, William Alberk. See you next time on the Arms Control Cruiser podcast. I repeat again. I repeat again. I repeat again. I repeat again.